Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Common Ground Bloberg. Can I invite you to stand? We are going to start our time together off by singing this morning. And what a great way to warm up by staying standing. It's better than sitting. The other way to warm up is to sing really loudly. Kids, we want to hear you. You can stand up as well because your bodies will feel warmer if you do. Before we sing, I'm going to read from Psalm 146, verse 8. It says, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. This morning, whether you feel like you are maybe imprisoned by a, a circumstance in your life, whether you feel like actually you're blind in some areas, not seeing things clearly, maybe the way that God wants you to see them, or just feeling plain old low. Wherever you find yourself this morning, God wants to meet you where you're at. And as we sing these songs, I pray that the the words in, in a way connect with your circumstance and where you're at, but at the same time that we can lift our hearts and worship God together. So over to the band and uh, eyes to the screens for the words as we sing along.
Father God, that you are a faithful God. Thank you, Lord, that you are here now in this moment, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you want to reach out into our hearts this morning, Lord. You want to be present, Father. We know you are here, Holy Spirit. And we want to worship you this morning. We open our hearts, Lord. We open our minds, our ears, God. And we come and we just worship you as a church, as a group, as a family and friends, Lord. We want to bring you all the glory and honor now. We open our lives. Let's sing and let's continue to worship. Foundation, I will put 
my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no song we could ever sing is Lord. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Let's sing to Jesus this morning. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Let's sing holy. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to go. Let's sing that one more time. Holy and holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. our prayer this morning, Lord, is that you use each one of us, God, as we gather here, and we will keep an eye on what your heart is telling us, Lord. We'll follow your leading, Lord. We are here to serve you, God. We are here to bless your name and worship you this morning, Lord. Let's sing, I'll build my life. And I will build my life. Upon your love, it is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Let's build our lives this morning. I will build my life. Upon 
Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Yes, Lord. Come sing on the end. Just as we um, were singing this morning and in song asking God, show me who you are, I just had a sense of God reminding me and wanting to remind us of what happened many thousands years ago when Moses approached God and said to God, show me who you are. And uh, the Bible says in, in Exodus 34, Verse 5 to 6, to 6, to 6. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with me and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Just sense God wanting to remind us of who He is this morning, wanting us to have a glimpse of His heart, that He is the Lord who is compassionate, that He is the Lord who is gracious, who is slow to anger. I don't know where your heart is this morning. Maybe there is a sense of guilt that you're dealing with this morning, and God wants to remind you that He's a God who is slow to anger but is filled with compassion. Maybe your heart this morning is wrestling with stuff and God wants to remind you that He's a God who is full of love, that His love for you abounds this morning. Why don't we open our hearts this morning and trust God by the power of His Spirit to stir up revelation of His compassion, of His love, of His goodness that abounds for us this morning. Why don't you close your eyes wherever you are. Lord God, as we sing, show us who you are. We ask of you by your Spirit, O oh Lord God, that you bring a fresh revelation of your heart for us this morning. Lord God, won't you give us a fresh taste of your compassion that goes out for us this morning? Won't you give us a fresh taste of your love that abounds for us? Won't you give us a fresh taste, Lord God, of your mercy that sets free? Of your mercy, Lord God, that lifts up burdens. Lord God, we look to you, we trust you this morning for lifting of burdens. We trust you this morning for a fresh encounter of the love of the Father, of the love of a God who is so good, who does not condemn, but a God who delights in doing us good. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, good, gracious, compassionate, and loving God. On the ear, on the lam, on the kunangba. On die sin, die gesalfde, on die opgestane Heer, die hoogste ere, lof en aanbede, verlos en kom neer van ons God. Die hoogste ere, nou en verewe, 
verlossen, kom niet van ons God. Aan ons hoop, aan ons hoop, aan ons redder, vir die offer aan die kruis. Uit ons harte, Voor die hemel zal ons zal die glorie prijs. Die woeste ere, lof en aanbede. Verlos en kom neer van ons God. Die woeste ere, nou en vir Before the kids, oh wow, my mic is working, yours is knocked, I'm sorry. There you go, you can all hear me. 
Um, before the kids go out, we have a quick few things to mention that we want to say while the kids are in the room. The first one is a reminder that we have uh, split or multiplied the uh, youngest class in our Kids Rock um, across in our um, Kids Rock quad. So uh, the, the um, Jumping Beans class has divided into two, and you can uh, see the breakdown there. If you've missed it, if you're a parent here with a child in that age group, you can just uh, look on the screen or ask Mareka if you're confused as to where your child should go. And then uh, the 4th of August, we excitingly have two... Uh, the slide is going to come. Two very awesome uh, events happening at the same time, but at different places. The first one is Ignite Friday. They're having a games night. That's for our grade fours to sevens. Where are all the igniters? Yes. Are you excited? Yes. So if you have a child in that uh, age group or you are a child in that age group, make sure that you get there, as well as Frequency Friday, our first Frequency Friday night. You can give them a round of applause because that is a big deal. And so if you are a high schooler or have a high schooler living with you or uh, close to you that you want to bring to that, you can chat to Andy for more information. Um, and uh, now we can release the kids. So kids, we're going to pray for you quickly. The reason why we always do this is, is it a bit, okay. the reason why we always do this is because you guys are so important to us. So if you're near a, a child, don't you want to lay your hand on them and let's bless them so that they really have a, a, not only a fun time, but also a fruitful time. We praise you so much, Lord, for our kids. Thank you so much that they, from a young age, can be exposed to your word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to them, that they would have loads of fun, that they would make lots of friends, and most importantly, that they know that you love them so, so much. We pray this in your name. Amen. So the Kids Rock leaders with the blue vest, please can you take the kids out? Parents, you don't have to feel the need to go with your kids, but if you feel that you want to settle them, then you're more than welcome to follow the crowd. And uh, while the kids are leaving, can we invite you to uh, maybe introduce yourself to someone if you're taking your seat? Um, if you haven't met the people around you, take a moment to say hi. So a very warm welcome to you. Um, if you um, are visiting us for the first time, especially, we want to say welcome, but welcome to everybody. Welcome to Common Ground Bloberg. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, Jolene, you are one of my favorite people to lead meetings with because uh, neither of us look short standing next to each other, although you look a little bit shorter than me. I thought she was going to say because of my sparkling personality. That too, that. and your, your excellent upfront ways. But whoever set this up, did not. they were not thinking of us. They... They were thinking of Andy, who's coming up after us. <laughs> so for all the parents, I, I took the liberty of actually just renaming or, or kind of giving my own little thing to this. So there's two spaces for the parents who have mostly left now with little, <laughs> with little ones. Um, so the first area I'm going to call the go slow and calm area. Through the double doors at the back here, in the foyer on the right-hand side, so literally on this side where I'm pointing, there's a live audio feed, so if you're in a calmer zone with your little one and you want to listen, you can actually listen to the preach and have a sort of more calm zone, that's the space for you. If you're in the more what I want to call the hustle-bustle zone, when your kids are a bit more noisy, you want to play, have a bit of noise. It's very graciously said, if, if it's chaotic with your family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you need to go out the doors across the walkway where everybody comes in to the quad on the other side, and on the left is a set of classrooms, the last one. So we put you as far away as possible so we don't hear the noise. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a, a live feed over there that you can watch the preach. If you're able to hear it, that's another story. But then there's someone that can help you with some tea and coffee, and also there's some changing areas if you need to change a little one. It's not only for moms, it's, it's co-parent friendly. Awesome. And... Uh those parents that are already in that room, we want to say welcome to you. And we know that most, a huge portion of this church is made up of parents with small children. And so we want to say that we see you and we see the effort that it takes to get to church on a Sunday. So well done. And um, thank you for joining us from the other side of the quad. We hope it's not too chaotic over there. Um, and then again, a welcome to you if this is your first time or maybe you've been visiting us for um, a a few times, a couple of times, but you still feel a little bit new in this space, we want to extend a very warm welcome to you. We would love to give you some information about who we are, and um, you can get that in a hard copy through these doors. We have like a little guest area table when you go out to grab some tea and coffee. There's also a team of some hopefully friendly looking faces. They've got lanyards around their necks. They'll be able to answer any questions that you might have um, and uh, hopefully connect with you after the meeting. 
But then also, of course, because we're in the modern age, we're on. We're not on Twitter, though, huh? We're not on Twitter. It's okay. No, but do but people Twitter's still tweet? Sort of, Is that like no, a thing? I don't think so. It's, it's become a bit of a, an no, old no thing. one. But everyone's shaking their this, heads. You can no. Follow nicely on Facebook. We've also got a really nice website that's been redone, and it's actually got a lot of helpful information. A lot of people ask questions. If you go to the website, you actually find it for yourself, which is quite nice. And then we also have Instagram. That WhatsApp telephone number at the bottom. Please save it to your phone and send an emoji, a thumbs up, a smiley face, whatever you feel like, winky face or whatever is your field for the day. Then you'll be added to our broadcast list or our WhatsApp community group. It's one-way communication. You probably, as Shane mentioned when you guys were away, <laughs> that you'll get three or four messages a, a week, I mean a month or so. So not too many. You're not going to be spammed. But it's a wonderful way just to keep in touch with things like, for instance, our banking details have changed recently. There's additional parking. Or, for instance, if there's a, a change in the week or a new event or something that you need to know about. Awesome. And uh, then we want to just take a brief moment to speak about what we call regular committed giving or financial generosity. And uh, generosity is a huge value, a part of the, the gospel, what it means to follow Jesus. And so generosity is a value of ours as a community. And we firstly want to say thank you to everyone who partners with us financially in and through this local church. And uh, because of that, because of the way that we're stewarding our finances, we are uh, able to bless many people and organizations and churches beyond just ourselves into this area, into our partner churches that we partner with uh, across South Africa, Africa, and the world. And um, so we want to say thank you. If you have any questions about what we believe about financial generosity or giving or stewardship, um, how this church stewards their finances, uh, you are welcome, obviously, to chat to any of us leaders, as well as a few of those questions are answered on our website, as Jolene said. Um, one of the cool things that uh, our regular committed giving gets to um, kind of underwrite is our gospel partnerships within advance. And uh, this weekend, Raj is visiting a church in uh, Boxburg, all the way in Joburg, and uh, he's preaching right now, or probably actually finished preaching right now, um, but they made a video for us this morning and uh, just how we can pray for them and a little bit of a catch-up of where he is, so eyes to the screen for that. Morning, Common Ground, Bloberg, and I got a lot with me from God First Boxburg. Myself and Mark and Mike are down here um, just visiting, and uh, I'll share a bit more of why we're here, but this morning we're in the Blast Group Chili uh, Joburg, and uh, with Rob at God uh, First Boxburg. Rob, hey, tell us about you and, and just how can we pray for you guys? Yeah, time. I think firstly, Common Ground, thank you so much for sending Roger and the guys up to us. It's such a, a blessing and a privilege uh, for us to have them with us. Um, but yeah, this morning, what you could be praying for us, we are desperate to be a church full of the Holy Spirit. We want to see people uh, come to faith, dead men, uh, made alive in Jesus, uh, His Spirit just moving powerfully and wonderfully. We want to see prophetic words coming out of the church and following in his footsteps so please be praying for that um i think what's so uh, we'd love for some prayer for some sun please could you okay? <laughs> both for you and the holy okay yeah, yeah. appreciate both well i don't know if katonians are the right people to pray the sun for it but uh, it really is great and then uh, a bunch of us all move up uh, to uh, a conference starting tomorrow yeah. advanced africa where churches from all over africa are part of the advanced partnering movements are going to be together. Won't you also just keep us in your prayers that that's a rich time full of God's guiding and strengthening for leaders. So um, we love you and uh, just so grateful to be partnering across the oh, nation this morning. Yeah. Bless you guys. Good to, good to be with you in some way this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Over to you. All right. So we have one or two, well, in particular, one uh, special event happening this weekend. I thought there'd be a slide. That's why I'm looking. It's I not think because I don't want to be. look at you, although the light is bright. There we go. So this week, it's actually on Wednesday already, right here in the auditorium. We're going to be have our special prayer and worship evening. I don't know if any of you attended last time, but it was rocking. It was so amazing. We, it's an extended time of prayer and, and worship where we can all gather together. It's wonderful for you individually. It's especially wonderful for us corporately as a church to gather, to seek God's face, to just freshly commit ourselves to Him, to hearing what, what's on God's heart for our church and for us, you know, together. So please prioritize that time, 6.30 to 7.45. So you'll be out here by 8, which is in time for most kids' bedtimes. So if you can make it, it'll be wonderful. And, and just come ready to, to enjoy God and to, to contribute if you can. And uh, then finally, we want to let you know, if you haven't heard already, about our new preaching journey, which is starting next week, Sunday, the 6th of August. And uh, we've called this Honestly Healthy, Scripture's Wisdom for a Tired, Stressed, and Busy World. And I think I don't have to convince you that uh, that's the world that we live in, tired, stressed, and busy. 
And I think too often experiences of feeling overwhelmed, stressed, tired, tired of feeling tired, that deep tired, it's not a sleepy tired, sometimes it is for some of you with small children, but for most of us, it's that it's kind of like a soul tired. And uh, we are wanting to have some honest conversations around what real health looks like. I think our, the culture that we're swimming in, there's an appetite for health and uh, somewhat uh, things around self-care and how we can uh, better steward our bodies and our souls and our minds. And we want to take a gospel angle on that and really look at what does it mean to be honestly healthy and maybe scratch a little bit deeper beneath the surface um, and get some of Scripture's tried and tested wisdom for our tired, stressed, and busy world. And uh, we feel that this uh, journey is going to be an incredibly important one for us as a community, um, but as well as people who are maybe on the fringes of this church, as well as in our wider community. And so we really want to prayerfully ask, we want to ask you to prayerfully consider who you would like to invite to join us along for this journey. Uh, it will be a great time for people to join in who don't usually go to church every Sunday. Uh, they will most certainly be blessed and challenged and um, yeah, and, and helped, I, I really believe, by being part of this journey. We uh, want to do our best to make it easy for you to invite people. So if you are part of our WhatsApp community group right now, Lauren is going to press send, and uh, they should be coming into your um, little WhatsApp inbox, this image with a little bit of the information about what the series is about, as well as um, how people, it's there. Okay, Andy says it's there. Great. Look, I've got no Andy notifications. Andy it's true. Yes. Um, and it's a way to test who's on the group, you know. Now you can all just check, am I on the group? Am I getting the messages? Um, and our prayer is that, you know, you can maybe reach out to a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, a family member who uh, you feel could benefit from this time. So once you forward that message on, who you would like to invite, obviously you can make it sound like your own. You don't have to pretend you wrote that. Um, but we just wanted to collate the information so that it's easy to share. Um, before our very own Viking gets up to preach with us, I'm going to call Yuri up, who's going to be doing the reading for us, and then it's over to Andy. This was set up for you. This is more your hat. There you go. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, like Nikki said, I'm Yuri, and I'm reading Revelation 1, 12 to 18. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with golden sash around his chest. His hair on his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Try to go back to, there we go, it's working, yay. I'm so cold. <laughs> if, you see me, if you see me trembling here, I can't claim it's fully my passion for the word, it's also just really cold. Um, so so that, that is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. That's got to be one of the best that the Bible has to offer. Really, you read a, verse, a passage like that, and you just think, wow, that is my king. That's Jesus. That's the Jesus that I serve. And we, say, we have this phrase, we say, Jesus is Lord. And the words, you can, you can kind of, they can roll off your tongue quite easy. Oh, yeah, Jesus is Lord. When you say Jesus is Lord, we're talking about that Jesus. We're talking about that Jesus. We're talking about this Jesus with eyes like fire. He's got a voice like thunder. He's got a face shining like the sun. Have you, I've got the sun in my eyes right now. Have you ever looked full into the sun? Don't. It's, you know what happens? You know what happens? You burn your eyes out. You, you're blind. You can't look at the sun. It doesn't work. And this, that's Jesus. Jesus will burn you. He's unstoppable. There's, you're either... When you get near Jesus and that shining, mighty, 
power of Jesus. You're either going to be burned to be purified like gold in a furnace, or you're going to be burned up like, well, like straw in a furnace. When you put that grass in the fire, it doesn't last long. That's Jesus. And so I want to say to you today, before I get any further, is give your life to Jesus. That Jesus. Jesus is Lord, the first and the last, the living one. We're doing a series called Unexpected Jesus. Uh, This is our last message on that topic. We're wrapping it up. Next week, we're moving on to Honestly Healthy, and I'm so excited for that. You'll see why in a little bit. I've actually got a whole point in my message about Honestly Healthy, not because we feel we need to advertise it too much, but because it just ties in so well with what I'm speaking about today. But then in the series about the unexpected Jesus, I don't think it would be right to leave the with the series without looking at the most, the most expected, unexpected bit of all, which is that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And why do I say it's expected, unexpected? Because we're actually all expecting it. Jesus told us he's coming back. So in that sense, it's very much expected. But what we don't know is when. We don't know when he's coming back, and we only have the faintest idea of what it will mean for us when Jesus comes back. So I want to take you through a few ideas about Jesus' return this morning to learn a bit more about what his return is going to mean for us and what it already means for us in the way that we should be living our life now in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back. So I want to read from Matthew 24, verse 42 to 44. It says this, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Maybe I should give you a bit of an outline of where I'm going today, just to to make it all make sense. So I've started off with that passage from Revelation to give you a picture of Jesus in his glory. The Jesus who walked the earth was Jesus in the flesh, Jesus walking as a man, and his glory, he didn't display it in full. He wasn't taking all his power and showing it. But Jesus, when he comes back, is coming back in glory. And that Jesus we read in Revelation is the Jesus we're going to spend eternity with. And when this verse says to us, stay awake, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect, you've got to think that glorious Jesus is the one who's coming back. So I'm going to just start off by looking a little bit at the expectation of Jesus' return. And then I want to take you through an interesting feature of Old Testament prophecy that sheds some light on the significance of Jesus' return. Then we're going to get to the most hectic point that I'll ever have to preach, which is the wrath of God. And you'll have to hang on with me for that one, because there is good news. And we'll close off looking at how we should live in light of Jesus' return. So to start off with, the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Now, the interesting thing is that the disciples, Jesus' disciples, Jesus told them he's coming back. And they lived out the rest of their lives expecting Jesus to come back like, like tomorrow, right? There was, they, they got quite confused, in fact. There was a little bit of, there were several moments you can read, like in Acts, they said to Jesus, Jesus, are you now going to restore the kingdom? Like, Jesus, you died, you rose again, so now it's the end, right? And as they went on, you see other little stories. This is quite interesting, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10 to 11. This is not the disciples specifically, But this is how seriously people at that point in time, when the Bible was written, how seriously they thought about Jesus' return. Paul writing to the Thessalonians, he says, Even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Interesting thing happening here in the Thessalonian church. The people were so convinced of Jesus' imminent return that they said, well, if Jesus is coming back next week, why do I need to go to work? I'm wasting my time at the office, and Jesus is coming back next week anyway. What good is a salary when Jesus comes back? It's logical. They just made a small mistake. He wasn't coming back next week, and then they ran out of money. They ran out of food. 
But they're like, hey, it's still coming back soon. I don't think I'm going to get a new job. So they just started to kind of mooch off of their hardworking brothers and sisters. And so Paul corrects them. And he says, listen, work, <laughs> please. Go to work. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. There is an expectation still that we would live our lives. We know Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. We can't be presumptuous to assume we can force him to come back by quitting our jobs and selling all our possessions and sitting, you know, in a beach chair waiting. That's not how it works. But, but I want you to see that they took it that seriously. They took it that seriously that Jesus was coming back, that they were willing to make radical change in their life, the wrong change, but they were willing to make radical change in their life in preparation. And every age of believers throughout this church age of the last 2,000 years has believed that Jesus was coming back soon. I think of, again, misguided attempts to prepare the world for Jesus' return, the Crusades. Okay, well, we've got to go take back the Holy Land because Jesus is coming soon. Misguided, but they took it seriously. You also get something that we call like kingdom now triumphalism. Those are technical words to say an over-understanding of how back Jesus already is. When we say, as a believer, you just never have to struggle and you can just claim the power of God and have it all now, healing and success, and because Jesus is the, the Lord. Yes, Jesus is the Lord, but he's not back yet. We live in an in-between, a now and a not yet. And it's not on us to decide when Jesus comes back or how much we want to, him to be back now. Yes, come, Lord Jesus. We're longing for Jesus to come. But until he does, this is what we must do. We must develop our sense of urgency, of urgency. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I can tell you with absolute certainty that he is coming back, which means we have to live differently. I, I play soccer for Sunningdale, and my coach always tells us after a match, he says, what you guys are doing is great, but you need to work on your urgency. It's not that you're making the passes bad. It's not that you're making the tackles bad. You're doing it too late, though. You're not doing it with energy. So in the same sense, with the concept that Jesus is coming back, it's not about doing different things. It's not about, like, reinventing Christianity. It's not about reinventing how to live life. It's actually about doing the same old boring things differently. We do them with urgency. We understand that Jesus is coming back. And therefore, when we are preaching the gospel, we preach it with conviction and with passion because it's, it matters. When we are serving and loving and caring, we do it with that urgency. When we're on the mission of God and we want everyone to hear the name of Jesus and to know that that, that Jesus, shining like the sun, is coming back, we do it urgently. Jesus is coming, and he's going to arrive quite suddenly. So let's turn a little bit uh, to one of the most fascinating aspects of Old Testament prophecy. This, I think, like, if you've read through Old Testament prophets, understanding this will help you to gain some perspective on what's going on here. I'm going to read Luke 4, verse 16 to 21. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Okay. So Jesus reads from Isaiah. I want to read the verse from Isaiah that he's quoting. Isaiah 61 verse 2. It says this, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's very interesting. That is very, very interesting. The year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. What did Jesus just do there? He stops in the middle of the sentence. Look at that. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and he rolled up the scroll. 
He didn't read about the vengeance. This is very interesting. Old Testament prophets, you can go and look, Isaiah, others in the Old Testament, they did not foresee the timing of God's plan. They had a limited revelation from God. They knew that a Messiah was coming. They knew that the judgment was coming, but they didn't understand when or how. They didn't foresee the church age that we're living in. For the Old Testament prophets, when they thought about the coming of Jesus, they understood it as one event. The Messiah comes with the judgment. And Jesus, in God's, you know, let me, hold on, go back a second. Even John, you know, John the baptizer, the last of the prophets, he didn't know. He was surprised at Jesus' ministry. Jesus, are you the one or should we expect another? Because he thought, this isn't quite what I expected. I was expecting a lot more like fire and brimstone, Jesus. You know, the, the judgment, where is it? And I've quoted already from Acts. When they had come together, they asked him, uh, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They, they thought of the coming of Jesus as one event, one time that he comes. And a lot was prophesied about Jesus in the Old Testament, about what he would do. And he began to do it. He began. But it's not complete. We're living in the middle of a sentence. We're living in a comma in Isaiah's prophecy. There's a gap between the first and the second coming of Jesus, and that's where we live. So if the first coming of Jesus meant the defeat of sin and the power of death, if the first coming meant salvation is available to all, what will the second coming mean? What does it mean when the unexpected Jesus returns? I'd like to read Revelation 19, verse 11. Um, Revelations 19, verse 11 to 16. That wasn't Jesus coming back. That's just <laughs> a few more minutes, Lord. Um, Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. It's another picture of Jesus returning in his glory. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron." He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. When John saw this Jesus, John who wrote Revelation, do you know what his response was? He said, Amen, come Lord Jesus. He will tread the winepress of the fury of of the wrath of God the Almighty. There's no scarier words in the Bible. Can I say also, before I go any further, if this is why you left the church, if this is why you stopped coming to church, you were just so tired of like scare them into heaven kind of tactics, threats and fire and brimstone, that's, that's not my intention this morning. That's really not. I don't mean to scare or to judge. I only want to tell you what the Bible says, and the Bible says Jesus is coming back. So, so the return of Jesus, first of all, is joy to the saints. It's joy to the saints. 2 Timothy 4 verse 78, Paul writes, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Who have loved his appearing. When Jesus comes back, those of us who are believers, it is good news. Happy day, Jesus is back. We will love the appearing of Jesus. No more sin. That sin that entangles you, that binds you, that trips you up day by day, and we wrestle against the fallenness of our flesh. Jesus comes back, and it's over. 
that battle is over. We'll be in glorious righteousness forever. When Jesus comes back, there's no more suffering for those who are in Jesus. We, we won't have to mourn. We won't have to lose loved ones. We won't have to be hurt anymore. No more sickness. No more fear. The, those, those crippling sicknesses of your body that you can't be healed of, of your mind that afflict you day and night, that you can't get away from, that we, we just don't know how to heal them as human beings. We are limited. We have incredible doctors, but they can't do it all. When Jesus comes back, happy day. We will rejoice forever with Jesus. But the return of Jesus is woe to unbelievers. Can I draw your attention again to the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty? I don't have time today to list out all the many woes which John foretold in Revelation. I would commend to you to go and read Revelation yourself. And before you say to me, whoa, that's a bit of a confusing book of the Bible. I tried that and it didn't go so well. I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a handle here on how to read Revelation. Don't worry so much about signs and symbols. Don't worry about timings and trying to figure out, is, the, is that guy, the, is that the beast that they're talking about? Is it this? Don't worry about that stuff. This is how you read Revelation. This is the paradigm. God wins. God wins. That is the point of Revelation. God wins. Evil will be judged. All will be made right, and the righteous will be with God forever. God wins. And when you go home and you start on reading Revelation for the next few days, remember that. This is about God, His victory, His triumph. But that wine press. Here's something that we don't talk about too often, but it's always a truth of our faith. There is an angry God in heaven. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Here's a few verses for you. Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Colossians 3, verse 5 to 6. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Romans 5, verse 9. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We are saved. We are saved, church. Our it's, our salvation is immeasurable. Give thanks to God. We are saved. But the salvation does not take away the wrath of God. It takes us away from the wrath. The wrath of God does not fall on us anymore. Praise God. But the wrath is still there. And you know what? Satan knows it. He knows it. We know it. Why does the devil prowl around making misery for, for people? Because he knows his day is coming. God will judge him. God's day of judgment is coming. But we can escape it, praise Jesus, by being in Jesus. Jesus has gone through the wrath. Jesus died and experienced the wrath of God on the cross. He's gone through it. So if we are in him, we are safe. So when I tell you that there's an angry God in heaven, that's not to make you nervous. No, God loves you. He's your father. We're in Jesus. We're safe from the wrath of God. But we need to understand this, that those who are outside Jesus will experience wrath on that day. Jesus is coming back. His second coming is not going to be like his first. The first time he came humbly to suffer and serve and save. And next time he's coming in might and glory to conquer and rule. This is glorious stuff. Let me say it again. Before, before I move on anywhere today, I want to say that Jesus is calling you. If you don't know Jesus, he's calling you to know him, to love him, to repent. As long as it's today, as long as it's still today, you can find mercy and grace. Because today is not that day of judgment. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of forgiveness. I don't mean to scare you into the kingdom of God, only to tell you that Jesus is coming back. But for now, enter into his kingdom today. 
And for those of us who are already in Christ this morning, we come to this question, how then should we live? How are we to live in light of the return of Jesus? The Bible gives us this answer, stay awake. I read from Matthew 24 earlier, let me just jump back there and say, therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Stay awake, be attentive, pay attention, look up, open your eyes, be aware, watch out, look around, stay awake. Here's a, an illustration of this way we should live. Ezekiel 33, verse 1 to 6 in the Old Testament. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. That's why I have to preach uncomfortable things like the wrath of God. Because it's not loving to watch something coming and not warn someone that it's coming, is it? So the first and foremost way that we should live in light of the return of Jesus is to stay awake in a world that is sleeping and to wake up others. To wake up others. You, every one of you who loves Jesus, Jesus has appointed you a watchman. You know he's coming back. You know it. And you also know people who don't know it. Warn them. Tell them. <coughs> Excuse me. Secondly, we're about to start an awesome new series, Honestly Healthy. It's a dual opportunity here. One, uh, we can learn to live better in light of God's promises and His faithfulness in our lives. The premise of the series is that we live our lives with stress, with overwhelm, with overwork. We, we're worn out, we're, we're ground down by life. And that's not the life that God has called us to live. God wants you to live a life that is healthy, that is joyful, a life that is spacious, where you've got the time and the energy to pay attention to the things that really matter. So we want to do this series to learn to live in light of God's faithfulness and in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back. We want to be honestly healthy. Secondly, it's an opportunity to invite people into the life that God has for them. Why don't, we, why don't we think about that? Who can we invite? How can we use this series? Thank you. That's helpful. Sometimes when I know I'm preaching, I shouldn't sing so loud in the worship. So how can we use this series and that's really why we have a series like Honestly Healthy. It's a tool for us, the church, to grow, but also to reach out. We know that the work of ministry of the, of the people of God is not restricted to the few standing up front. It's not only the band or the preacher who are doing the work of God. It's for all of us. And so we wanted to create a tool that we can use to reach out into our community and invite people into the life of Jesus. So that's my challenge to you today. Make it count. Let's take this series and use it for all it's worth and grow in it as well. But we must not get complacent. We must stay awake. We must be alert. Because although Jesus is not back today, although he takes his time, he's not going to wait forever. He's not. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 to 13 the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, 
and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. I'll pause there for a second. The Lord is not slow. He's patient. He gives us time. Time to repent. Time to preach the gospel. Time to bring in all those who God is calling. But the day of the Lord is coming. And then verse 11 goes on. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Isn't that incredible there? Hastening the coming of the day of God. We don't know when he's coming, but we know that certain things must happen first. Jesus told us there's going to be certain things that will take place before he comes back. One of those things is, he said, the gospel will be preached to every nation tribe and tongue. The gospel will be preached throughout the whole world. We have this incredible privilege, actually, to be part of bringing Jesus back. We can preach his gospel. We can take the steps that prepare the world for his return. That's amazing. That really is amazing. Secondly, in lives of holiness and godliness, this goes back to what I said earlier, it's not about doing different things. It's about doing the same things differently. As you're living your life, God's not calling you necessarily to quit your job, but to do your job knowing that Jesus is coming back. God's not calling you to... I don't know what he's not calling you to. You might know, but, but what he is calling you to do is to do everything he puts in front of you with this awareness that he is coming back. Live your ordinary lives. Here's a side note. Live, in, live the life he gives you. And for example, have families, have children. Some of, the, some of the elect, some of the people that God is going to save haven't even been born yet. It's incredible. Psalm 22 verse 31 says, They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. God has plans for our children, children that we haven't got plans for yet. You know? But there's going to be children born in this community who God's already marked out for his purposes. That's why I say live your ordinary lives because we are called to be ordinary, holy ordinary, ordinary in God's kingdom. You don't have to be a superstar, but you do have to know Jesus is coming back. Make no compromise with sin. I, I, we were talking about this in frequency before the meeting. I said, as you deal with temptations and with struggles in your life, ask yourself this question. If Jesus were to come back now, would I want him to find me doing this? I was thinking, like, if Jesus were to come back on Sunday morning, would he want to find me sleeping in at home and skipping church? I'm not trying to pressure you. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, but... Yeah. <laughs> you know, those, those addictions in your life that you know you don't love and you know are not good for you, you, you need to cut it out. You, I'm not... You know, you've got to just make no compromise with sin because Jesus is coming back. And in the meantime, he has given you grace and he will give you more grace and he will keep on giving you the strength and grace you need to live. So live knowing that Jesus is with you and Jesus is coming back. How long have I been preaching for? Not too long. I'm almost running out of words. That's why I ask. In, in closing then, I want to read to you Jude 24 to 25. It says this. This is also one of my favorite passages. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Church, Jesus is coming back and we're going to be there to see it.
we're going to be there to see it. Because he chose us, because he called us, because he paid the highest price for us. And why is that? It's not so we could live in fear. It's so that we could rejoice and delight in his coming. It's so that when he comes back, we will be those who have loved his appearing. When Jesus comes back, joy, joy, that we can glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is why he made us. He made us so that he could love us welcome us into his kingdom and we could enjoy him and glorify him forever. It's this beautiful, eternal cycle. The more that we enjoy God, the more glorious we show him to be. And the more glorious we see him, the more we enjoy. It's just, that's heaven. That's what we're going to do forever. It's just getting to know God, glorifying him. I can't tell you, don't even ask, how does that work? What are we going to do with our time? But it's going to be glorious. That's why Jesus is coming back. Can I ask you to stand? And the band can come up. And let's, let's, before we worship, let's read these verses. You can put the Jude passage back up. Let's read it together as a declaration of praise to him. Let's read this together. One, two, three. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, he sets his feet, my Savior on that cursed.
rising sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my grace transfixed on Jesus face Amen Let's declare that this morning He shall return in robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My face you join me in a moment of prayer. Let's close our eyes. God, we want to respond to what we've heard this morning. And Lord, truth leaks from our lives, if we're honest. We can sometimes feel filled in this place, but we know as we go from here, we leak. That this morning you have woken us up from complacency, maybe. Maybe you're dealing with guilt or fear. You don't want us on either of those poles to be complacent about what's most true, but also to live in fear. And so we want to find the perfect balance in you, Jesus, and the freedom that you bring to us. I'm going to ask you where you are to just picture your week ahead. What would it look like to step into your week ahead with the truth of today's message not leaking out of you to really believe Jesus is coming back we don't know when but this whole thing isn't an idea this whole story of the gospel isn't a fairy tale it's the most true thing and he is coming back what does my parenting look like in light of that what does my thought life look like what does my work week look like in light of that what spending habits simply fall away in light of that? What friendships do I need to build into in light of that? What habits do I need to let go of and which ones do I maybe need to pick up on in light of the truth that He is coming back? We don't want to leave this place complacent. We don't want to leave this place in fear, but we leave with the joy of knowing that you keep us from stumbling and you go with us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your empowering presence, for your guidance and your comfort. And I pray for all of us as we step into this week that we would really go about our days and our weeks and every task that you've set before us with this truth in mind. Fill us up, God, and send us out. We love you and we love your word and we love being with your people.
please don't rush off. Today we have some tea and coffee. Not just today, every Sunday. Today on special tea and coffee. There's tea and coffee through here and a sweet treat. Please don't rush off. Uh, we have a team of people who are available to pray with you about anything that you need prayer for. Maybe you want to respond to this morning's meeting. Maybe you need a prayer for healing for yourself or someone that you know. Maybe you trust in God for a certain set of circumstances in your life. There's going to be a team up front here ready to pray for you. Parents, don't forget to fetch your kids. And uh, we will see you in here on Wednesday night at 6.30. It's going to be awesome. See you then. Have a great Sunday.